Welcome back to Murphy's Garage. Got a busy video this time. Got the 4.3 Atlas in. We're gonna get it installed, but first let's talk about a couple things. This is the flange where the transfer case bolts to. So it's fairly small and it's, it's only about a half inch thick. Then you take and you suspend the weight off to the side, either left drop or right drop, and you create a lot of torsional weight here. So in addition to a cross member, I also recommend taking some of that stress off of this flange by creating part of your cross member mount to hold the tail of the transfer case. Now, that being said, you don't want two cross members and I'll show you why. So here's my little demonstration as to why you don't want two cross members. Let's pretend this piece of flat plate is my transfer case and transmission. This side will be the transmission. This side will be where the transfer case is bolted to it because we know it's rigid where you bolt your transmission to your transfer case. And then, you know, you'll have a bushing on both sides mounted to the frame. So in this example, Let's just say we've got this mounted to the frame on both sides, mounted to our transmission and transfer case. Now you're out four wheeling and your frame starts flexing a little bit. So when this frame flexes even a little bit, what happens? All of a sudden you've got an air gap and your transmission is trying to flex. Well, it's going to go to the weakest point, which is going to be the thinnest wall of your transmission. And that's when your transmission breaks in half. So what I recommend is using one cross member, it mounts to the transmission and then has a offset of some sort to mount to the transfer case and you're using one cross member frame starts flexing, the whole unit moves as one instead of doing one of these numbers. Uh, that could probably save you a whole bunch of money in a transmission. Here's the transfer case bolted to the transmission and the adapter. Then I take a couple pieces of flat plate, make my pattern that will mount to the frame, drill it. I always mark which side of the frame because they never seem to be perfect bolt those plates to the frame, then I cut some heavy wall square tube and my bushings and tabs and I tack them all together where I need them to go. After that I pull them all out and finish weld them. Now I bolt everything back in and I cut a piece of plate and drilled it to match the transfer case and then I tack it in to the cross member, pull it all out, weld it, put it all back in and now you can see the transfer case and transmission both are supported by that cross member and it's independent of the frame movement. Alright, now we're going to jump back over to some wiring on the chassis I finished up. I finished up some chassis wiring by adding some LED lights, front driving lights. I also added those same lights to the rear for backup lights. And then I also had a couple of LED lights that I added front and rear for rock lights. And of course I had to upgrade to some modern headlights. Now we'll get back to the drivetrain. I ordered some pretty heavy duty drive shafts for this Jeep. The transfer case yokes are 1350 CV flanged. The tubes are 188 wall. The rear yoke is a 1350 joint and you can see I also drilled it and used U-bolts instead of the straps. Only got a few more things to finish before we go wheeling. You can see the oil pan on this hangs down enough to where it has hit me with a rock and ruined my day written all over it. So I decided to build a good skid plate system for the oil pan and for the transmission pan. I strutted the plate up into the engine block and mounted it directly there and then at the tail end I mounted the back side of that skid plate to the cross member. That way it moves with the engine and doesn't fight it. You can also see I drilled a hole for access to the drain plug. Now I'll haul it off to the exhaust shop and get some pipes hung. I don't have an exhaust tube bender so I have to 
use my local shop, which is okay. He did a good job. Wrapped the exhaust from the header flanges around the front of the pan, kept it up high, tucked up out of the way so it won't get hit. Once he ran it over the cross member, I just had him stop there and I added the flange and muffler once I determined where my belly pan was going to sit. Speaking of belly pans, I took some quarter inch plate, jacked it up and templated it against the frame, cut it out, I added some ribs to it, and you can also see that quarter inch plate sticking up. That's to protect the transmission cooler in case I have a driveline failure. With everything installed, you can see how well that plate will protect the transmission cooler if that driveline breaks, goes whipping around. And I used tabs to mount the belly pan so that you didn't have bolt heads hanging down to get beat up. And it sits nice and flat this way. I did just want to point out, since the belly pan and the skid plates are mounted separately and move separately, uh, you can see just a little bit of air gap between them just to prevent anything from binding up. And on to some interior and miscellaneous stuff. I got a call from a friend of mine who was out at a couple of four-wheel drive shops in the Denver area, and she asked me if I was still looking for some Mastercraft Baja seats, which I was. She sent me a couple pictures of these and said that a shop ordered them, had them custom covered in this orange leather, and then the customer didn't like them, so they've been sitting on the showroom floor for a year. She did some negotiation, and I got these seats for less than half of new. That was a huge score. These are the interior door panels I got from BJ's Off-Road. I just like the fit. I like the look. They won't rot. They don't hold moisture. And then onto the dash, that first button is for a horn, and then the four toggles, there were already a couple holes there, so I drilled a couple more, and that's where I mounted the switches for all the rock lights and driving and reverse lights. On the other side of the steering column, next to the vent, there was also a hole there. That's where I mounted the ARB compressor switch. Where the clock used to be, I now have switches. The switch on the left is for that interior light that you can see up there in the corner, and the other switch is for this rear cargo light. Uh, I also then wired in a 12 volt accessory for the cooler and an inverter. With the engine in and able to cycle the suspension and see where things hit and stop, I was able to weld in the bump stops to the Dana 60. Now just a side note, I did do some upgrades to the Dana 60 with an air locker and some 35 spline axles, but I'm gonna at some point spend a whole video on how to upgrade a Dana 60, so we'll do that at another time. When I was doing the rear bumper, I noticed that the rear tailgate was separating, and the reason that started separating is the body mounts in here, you can see this body mount right here, they had broken apart. So I took a piece of angle iron and I welded all the structure back together. And I didn't have any body mounts laying around, but I had a couple of uh, transmission mounts that matched. So I put a pair of these in one on each side and that resolved that problem. When doing those rear body mounts, I also built this roll bar that's bolted to the C pillar, the floor, and then cross braced. This allowed the tailgate opening to stay square. Now when I close the tailgate, the lines are at least reasonably straight, it's smooth, it doesn't rattle, it all works. Another thing I did, I had the headliner in here and it had been covered with cloth. I pulled the cloth off and I used some of that uh, uh, liner that you spray in beds and repainted it all and I really didn't like it that well and I didn't like the extra rattling and I really didn't care much about having the heat insulation. So uh, I just pulled it all out, painted it. I think that works just fine. Got me some rigid tool bags uh, for accessories and tools and mounted those in. I also got a truck bed mat and cut it to fit, which has an air gap underneath so it won't rust. Everything installed. Now it's time to go on a test drive. took it out to our little local playground, Bangs Canyon, did some tests on it, made sure it didn't overheat, had to make a couple minor adjustments to the four link, 
After that, went on a couple of the local uh, close-in trails with some of our uh, Jeep Club groups out here. Uh, got a few bugs worked out, but overall everything on this Jeep works just like it's supposed to. Now for the real field trip. Got the ARB in, all the camping gear in, and we're going to head out to the Uray full-size Jeep Invasion. There should be quite a few Jeeps out there, other people that are as into this as I am. Down in Uray, the organizers were kind of filing us into an organized chaos, getting us ready for a group photo. I just had to show this truck off. Uh, a, a body and paint mechanic owns this one. He stretched the frame, made a crew cab J truck, since these didn't come from the factory. This one's also running one tons in an LS. Here's another one I really liked, a J truck ambulance. You just don't see these. All right, once the organizers got us all kind of lined up and somewhat organized so that we could take the group picture, I did some walking around. Uh, there were a couple of Wagoneers here that looked like they rolled off the showroom floor. They were absolutely beautiful. There were a lot of custom J trucks, a lot of custom Wagoneers and Cherokees. I was really surprised there were a bunch of 401 AMC V8 still running around this group. I was also surprised there were 9 or 10 LS conversions here. My uh, acquaintance from Delta showed up with the Sem 715, which was a big hit. And of course, I like this particular Cherokee, but I'm a little bit biased. Uh, continuing walking around the place, I did discover this uh, wood paneled Wagoneer, which is sitting on Dodge 3500 stuff, including the 12 valve Cummins under the hood. That one I really liked as well. Um, another one that seemed to stand out amongst a lot of these, and you don't see them very often, are the Stepside J trucks. So this one was pretty rare. After a day's fun and entertainment and dinner, we all went back, camped out, hoteled, whatever it was, and the next day we all broke into smaller groups and headed up the hill for some four-wheeling. My group started with five and ended up with three. After going through Ure to Poughkeepsie Gulch, I'm just going to start the music and let you enjoy the wheeling show. Oh, you hit your
thanks for watching and on the next video we'll be starting on a little bit of J truck work here and please like subscribe and share my channel i appreciate it